I kind of get into how you use these equations and stuff. Just some general vocab you need to be aware of that you'll you'll hear used in these problems. And um, you know, last class I told you that evolution is change over time, and that's a really vague definition. So we want to get a little more specific. When I, when I say change. I want you to think about the change in the amount of alleles in a population. Now, anybody, what's an allele? Anybody remember what an allele was? So an allele is a form of a gene. If like a gene is a ice cream, is ice cream, an allele is a flavor of ice cream. If the gene codes for a hair color, an allele will be, you know, a certain color of hair. Okay, so in other words, the change in like the percentages of different alleles in the population over time. Um, and it depends on a few different factors. So um, uh, I have a slide going each, over each one of these individually. So I'll go over those um, on the next slide, but let me, uh, let me explain gene flow. Gene flow is this idea of the movement of alleles from one population to another. So this picture kind of summarizes it pretty well. Like in your population, you would have um, like a bunch of alleles. Like let's say this beetle is like homozygous dominant. This beetle is maybe homozygous recessive. This one's, you know, heterozygous. Gene flow, and then maybe this population has all of these beetles are all homozygous recessive. Something like that. Different percentages of the genotypes in one population versus the next. Gene flow is this idea of like one of these, uh, uh, the alleles moving from one population to the next. So meaning like, let's say like 75% of the alleles in this population are the dominant allele. But over here, maybe 50% are the dominant allele. If you have a beetle move from this population to that population, you're going to increase the percentage of the dominant allele since this beetle is more likely to have a dominant allele. That's the idea of gene flow. It's just... Thinking of like beetles and species, not as like organisms, but as, as like collections of alleles. And that'll make a little more sense why you want to think of it, things like that, when we go over Hardy Weinberg. Okay, so to go over um, these other vocab words, let's do them separately. So gene pool, that's a collection of genes among a population. So kind of a similar picture to the beetles one, but if he's focusing on one specific population, so like, let's say um, whatever the gene is, like, we'll, let's just call it the letter B, you know, this, are these hogs? Hogs, am I right? I don't know. Anyway, th this hog is heterozygous. This hog is homozygous dominant. But if you take all of the different alleles these hogs collectively have and you put them all together, the collection of the, you know, like the percentages of like the dominant and the percentage of the recessive, that, that collection of them, along with all of the other like genes, be it like the letter C, A, D, all the other genes that make up the organism, the collection of all of those alleles, that's the gene pool. Okay. Okay. Then um, we have something called uh, relative or allelic frequency. So that is just the percentage of a certain allele in a population. So, um, you know, for example, if you're heterozygous um, uh, and you're black, that means you're big A, little a. So 48% of the mice would have big A, little a. 16% of the mice would be um, little a, little a. And then 36% would be big A, big A. Those percentages, that would be referring to like the percentage of say the brown fur allele or the percentage of the black fur allele. So whether, you know, depending on whether you're looking at a population of, of like these mice, like on one area of the world versus another, these percentages of alleles can change. Or within one population, the percentages can change over time if that population is evolving. So in other words, evolution would be like the change and the percentage of like homozygous brown or homozygous black, um, things like that over time. Uh, okay, so coming to uh, Hardy Weinberg. Let me back up. I don't know if I got all these words. I didn't get genetic equilibrium and genetic drift. So let me do these two. Genetic equilibrium, think of like when we went over equilibrium just in biology speak, like or like chemical equilibrium, let's say. If you're at chemical equilibrium, it's not saying there's no chemical reactions happening. It's just 
you're not changing like the rate of making the products of the, or the reactants. That rate is like leveled out. Um, so genetic equilibrium, the frequency, meaning the percentage of alleles is not changing. Meaning if like there is a 30, 36% of the alleles are the dominant, if the population is at genetic equilibrium, each time you go to a new generation, you would stay at 36%, okay? And if you go up or down from that 36%, then we say that population has evolved, it's changed. Genetic drift, think of genetic drift like you're flipping a coin. Um, if you flip a coin 10 times, you should get five heads and five tails, but you may not, right? Because you have a small sample size. So genetic drift, it's basically getting out if you have a small sample size, Small sample sizes, small populations can get changes in the frequency of their alleles just because of chance, not because there's actually um, actual genetic variation present. Think of it this way. Like, let's say I grab like 10 students randomly from a clane. There's a, there's a very good chance that those 10 students wouldn't actually like reflect the actual like demographics of a clane. I can just randomly grab like 10 white dudes just by chance, right? And that doesn't necessarily mean like all of McLean is made of just white males. Like it wouldn't necessarily mean that it's just random chance, genetic drift would just, uh, just random changes cause that, uh, that, uh, that thing to happen. Okay, so getting into Hardy-Weinberg. The idea of Hardy-Weinberg, um, uh, the, the principle of Hardy-Weinberg is trying to analyze is a population evolving? How you figure out if a population is evolving is if you um, don't have these conditions met. So if you violate any of these conditions, only one of these conditions, a population will evolve. So in other words, for a population to not evolve, there must be random mating. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide, actually. This slide, I think, does a little bit better for you and with better pictures. So here... These are the five uh, assumptions of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So again, this would mean no evolution. If we meet these five conditions, there will be no evolution. If there is no selection, what this is saying is that um, whether you're like, say, this color or you're that color, that doesn't give you an advantage to survive and reproduce. That's what they mean by no selection. There's no, the differences that are represented by these frogs doesn't cause them to survive better in the environment versus another difference, okay? The second is no mutations, right? Um, because if you have mutations, if you have mutations, you're gonna change, mutations will cause change in allele frequencies. That's why you can't have mutations. Like meaning if like maybe this frog was like, uh, had more uh, dominant alleles, but then mutations happen that turn a dominant allele to recessive allele. That would then cause the percentages, the allele frequencies to change, which would be evolution. Uh, the third is no migration. Reason being, um, these frogs, they, have, they look different. They're gonna have different frequencies of alleles, a different gene pool than these frogs. So if, uh, hey, frogs are toads, what would be a better word for them? Frog, frog good enough for everybody? Okay. Um, if these TCU horn frogs migrate over here, this will then mess up, not mess up, but like this would then change, nothing wrong with horn frogs. Uh, <laughs> this would, uh, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. That is not very good at football. Yeah. Not everybody can be any of football. Anyway, if these frogs go over there, that's gonna change the, the allele frequency. That, that will then cause this population to not be at equilibrium. All right, number four, large population. This is what I was getting at with the flipping of the coin or like the grabbing of 10 random students from a claim. If you limit the population size, that will then mean that you may not necessarily get the, uh, the, the, the distribution of alleles that you would need for that population, uh, that that population should have. And the final is random mating. So random mating basically is this idea that like, just because this frog is tall, dark, and handsome, doesn't mean he gets uh, more ladies than like this frog who's small and not dark and has got some goofy looking eyes, right? Like random mating would say, lady frogs can't discriminate. It's not okay to discriminate between these two frogs. 
If they did, that would mean this population is not at equilibrium. Evolution is happening, and the tall, dark, and handsome frogs, those traits would then start predominating in the population more than whatever that is. Okay. So that's the idea of hardy weimar equilibrium. You, you don't have changes. Um, all right, now getting into kind of like the actual math of it. How you calculate if a population is in hardy weimar equilibrium is using these two formulas. And these are on your, um, uh, your formula sheet. This is actually like a, a screen grab from uh, the, uh, that part of the, uh, um, <laughs> you know, the formula sheet. And uh, I wrote it up here on the board just for quick reference. P plus Q equals one, where we say that P, that is the frequency or the, the amount, you can think of it kind of like a percentage of the dominant allele. Q is the frequency of the recessive allele. So we call it the, the lowercase letter. And then uh, that those equal one. Now, why they equal one is because like when you're doing frequencies, one would equal like 100%, 0.5 would be 50%. Frequencies are basically it's like you're to divide a percentage by 100, or if you took a frequency and multiply it by 100, you get to a percentage. So that's why it's a one there. All right, then you have a second formula that says P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals 1. Now, here's what you actually have to uh, memorize about these formulas. You need to understand that P is the dominant allele. And here's how you can remember that. What does a lowercase d look like? If you put the thing down, flip it, and reverse it, what's it, what's it look like? It looks like a capital P, right? So capital P looks like a dominant, right? And that's just by convention. That's not necessarily like a... When you're doing these calculations, you can use whatever letters you want. Q, just by convention, is a recessive allele. Um, hey, what comes after Q in the alphabet? R, good job. I'm actually impressed. I was thinking I'll be at the start of A to get there. <laughs> Anyways. Um... I'm, I'm more impressed that I figured that out that quick. Uh, all right. Q is a recessive. So then the second formula... P squared is homozygous dominant. Now understand why that makes sense. Because if P would be the, the capital A, P squared would be two A's. If you have two A's, you know, if you multiply two things together, it's the same thing as just squaring uh, the one, one of the terms. Then two PQ, um, you have the capital A, that's your, that's your P, lowercase a, that's your Q. Now where the two comes from is if you do a Punnett square, and you cross two um, heterozygous individuals, you get two of the boxes that are heterozygous. That's why you multiply by two. Okay. And then Q squared because you have two lowercase a's. Okay, so let's look at um, some sample numbers here. So uh, like the simplest way they could ever really give these to you is they would actually give you the frequency of the dominant and the recessive alleles. So let's say, let's say they, they tell you that the dominant allele is at a frequency of 0.3. That would mean P equals 0.3. And the recessive allele is at a frequency of 0.7. So Q equals 0.7. Now notice how these add up to 1. That's because of this formula. And it's one because that would be like 100% and frequency speak. Now then, they would ask you, hey, calculate the, the, the frequency or the percentage of the different genotypes. Calculate the frequency of big A, big A, big A, little a, and little a, little a. How you would do that is you just plug and chug, right? P squared, well, if you know that P is 0 0.3, you would just do 0 0.3 squared, and that would give you 0.09 and then you multiply by 100 to get to a percentage. How you got the, uh, um, uh, the heterozygous would be 2PQ, so 2 times frequency of P, which is 0.3, times frequency of Q, that's 0.7, that would give you 0.42. And then so on for, for to find the homozygous recessive. Okay, so this said, not, not too bad. And, um, So understanding what this means, what this is telling you is those, those frequencies you get here, if they, like this is saying for this specific population, 
this would be the frequencies of those alleles if the population is not evolving. So let's say I'm a scientist and I go study this population and I find in that population that 60% of that population has the, uh, the homozygous recessive genotype. That would tell me what? Supposed to be 49% if it's a hardy wine, wine break equilibrium, but actually 60% of them are little a, little a. What does that tell me? Ken? Yeah, it is evolving, right? It is, it is changing, right? It's supposed to be 49%, but if it changed to 60%, things don't just change for no reason. That's a sign that, and, and, and really connect this. I think that's easy to lose sight of this. What that's saying is that one of these five principles a hardy weinberg equilibrium is being violated. Maybe the female frogs are now are now discriminating against, you know, this guy right there, you know? Or, you know, migration's happening. The horned frogs are coming over or something. One of these principles is being violated, so the evolutionary biologist would try to figure out, well, which of these principles of hardy weinberg equilibrium is causing that percentage change in a genotype? Okay. So let's get into like an actual problem. You know, uh, this would be more of like a traditional problem you would see on an AP test. So they would they would give you a population of say cats, and they're telling you you got um, black and white cats, and they're they're telling us that um, black is dominant and white is recessive. Um, okay, and they're telling us the population is a thousand cats. 840 of those cats are black. Now, to be black, there's two genotypes to be black. You could be big B, big B, or big B, little B. And to be white, you would be only little B, little B. Okay? So, 840 of them are black. 840. So, of that 840, you don't know how many of that 840 are big B, big B genotype or big B, little B genotype, okay? That's a key thing to understand uh, for how I'm gonna show you how to do this calculation. Now, for white, they tell us that 160 of them are white. But here's the deal. When you're homozygous, when you have a, when you show the homozygous, when you show the recessive phenotype, you only have one option. You will always be little B, little B. That is a key thing to understand when doing these calculations. So, because what that means is we will now focus on this. And here's what that does for us. If I know that out of my population of cats, 1,000 cats, and 160 of them are white, that would tell me that 0.16 of those cats have the little b, little b genotype. And what is little b, little b? That's Q squared. Okay, well, so what? Well, how, if I have Q squared, I gotta get to Q. For all you mathematicians out there, how would I get Q? I got 0.16 is Q squared. How would I find Q? You take the square root of both sides, right? Good job. So the square root of 0.16 is 0.4, not 0.04. That's where um, uh, I can see some error. That's 0.4. Now, you're like, okay, cool. Well, to find the other things they want us to find, you know this formula now. I now know, okay, well, P plus 0.4 equals 1. So then, you know, seventh grade algebra would tell you, oh, P must be 0.6. And if you minus 0.4 from both sides, you got P as 0.6. So that tells me my, my dominant allele is at a frequency of 0.6. So now to do the last part of it, they want the frequency so that we just found the allele frequencies, 0.4 and 0.6. Now we gotta find the frequency of the genotypes. So if I wanna find the frequency of, um, Let's say I want to find the frequency of uh, the genotype, not A, um, the genotype big B, big B, okay? Well, big B, big B, that's the same thing as P squared, okay? Well, I could find P squared because now I know that P is 0.6. So 
So I can find the frequency of big B, big B by doing 0.6 squared, which is 0.36. So 0.36 is the frequency for big B, big B. And we can do the same thing for uh, the heterozygous, big B, little b. And our second formula, heterozygous is 2PQ. So 2PQ. So I would do 2 times the frequency of P, which is 0.6 times the frequency of Q, which is 0.4, and you would get uh, 0.48. Yeah, 0.48. All right, one more to do. So then to find the frequency of little b, little b, you would do Q squared. And we actually already have Q squared. That's what we found up here. So that would be 0.16. Now, check yourself before you wreck yourself or something. 0.36 plus 0.48 plus 0.16, if that doesn't equal one, you messed up. So uh, fortunately for us, that equals one. That's how you know you did it right, okay? Now then the last thing they want us to do is to find the number of individuals per genotype. So we gotta do that last step. So to figure that out, let me give us a little space here. To find the number of individuals per genotype, I would multiply 0.36 by the number of total individuals. So I have a total of 1,000 individuals, and 0.36, well, see, 0.36 of them should be uh, big B, big B. So then 360 of them should have the big B, big B genotype. Okay? And then same, you know, same strategy for the other one. So do 0.48 times a thousand. So 480 of them should be heterozygous. And then 0.16 times a thousand. So 160 of them, which we already knew, are the white um, uh, genotype. And then you can check your work because if you add up all those numbers, that should equal a thousand. Otherwise, you did something wrong. Is that blue still uh, dark enough for people in the back? It's good. Any questions about that? It seems like, like, I just left it there, it seems kind of crazy, like we just did something insanely complicated, but it, it all comes back to, the, that's why I circled this. This whole thing, the hardest part about doing these problems, at least for me, like I had to like remember how to do this again, like just a couple days ago, is remembering this is remembering you start with the, you have to remember that when they tell you that 160 of them are white, you remembering, oh, I the only thing that is white is if you're little b, little b. And little b, little b would be q squared. And then everything else flows from there because then if you know q squared, you know q. If you know q, you can find p and then so on. Okay? All right. Um, these next few slides are just kind of, I don't know, just somebody else doing the problem for you, if uh, that's helpful. But it, it's all the same thing. All right, so I got another problem for you. Now here, oh, and before I move on from that, so what you would then do with those numbers is, if you then studied a population, so like here, they give us another population, and they're saying, hey, this population of 800 cats 672 are black, 128 are white. Is this population Hardy Weinberg equilibrium based on what we calculated what Hardy Weinberg equilibrium is for a population? So, how we would figure that out is we need to use these numbers and figure out do the P and Q I get from these numbers match up with the P and Q from a population that is in Hardy Weinberg equilibrium? Okay, so let's do that. Again, focus on the, uh, the homozygous recessive. Focus on the recessive one because that's the one that you know for sure. So I know that 128 out of the 800 are, uh, that's going to be my, uh, my Q squared, which is um, the little b, little b. So I don't know. Anybody got that 128 divided by 800? I wish I could do that in my head. 
All right. So 0.16 of them are Q squared. Okay. Well, then if I want to find Q, I got to compare my, my I got to get Q. Then this is my Q squared. Then I take the square root of both sides. And so 0.4 is my Q. So then is this population Hardy-Watt equilibrium or not? It would be, right? Because these, these numbers line up. And what does it mean to be in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium? I think it's easy to know the calculations, but have no idea what any of that means. Like, what does it mean that this is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium? What it means is these five pictures here are being met, right? No selection, no mutation, no migration, no a large population random mating. There's no evolution happening in this uh, population. This population here, here, is at genetic equilibrium. Okay. All right, I got one more for you, then I'll let you start working. So here we're looking at um, a beak color. So they're telling us that black beak is dominant. So capital D is our uh, black beak. And that's dominant over the yellow beak. So yellow is recessive. Um, and they're telling us that uh, we got 210 individuals. Um, 245 of them are big, are big D, big D. Or I'm sorry, 210. 210 of them are big D, big D. Um, I think it's actually an important thing to kind of make note of is, I, I, especially when you're like doing the AP exam, you're going fast. Is like, if you notice what I just did there, I quickly put 245 with big D, big D. Make sure you get the numbers right with your, put the numbers in the right spot. Anyways, um, 245 are heterozygous, big D, little d, and 45 are little d, little d. Okay? And then they're wanting us to calculate all those terms that we did on, on that, that first problem we did together. So where you start can be kind of up to you. I really focus on the, the recessive. That's always the easiest spot to start because you know that little d to little d is 45. And you know that little d little d corresponds to q squared. So you know then that q squared equals 45 divided by the total number of individuals, 210. So what is that? 0.2143. So 0.2143 percent are going to be Q squared. Yeah. Okay. And it's just 210 individuals with the genotype capital D capital D. Oh my gosh. I make one mistake. I still rattle now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes. Okay. You have to, we need to find our total individuals in the population. So total individuals is 500. Thank you, Tiffany. So little d, little d, 45 of 500 are going to be the little d, little d. So to find the frequency for uh, um, your Q squared, you would get 0 0.09. That makes a lot more sense. Okay. That's another thing to keep note. If you get like some goofy number, the AP exam is probably not going to give you super goofy numbers. So keep that in mind. If you get something goofy, maybe you goof somewhere. Okay, so then to find Q, you just got to do the square root of both sides. So then Q will be 0.03. Okay. Now then, we can find P because if Q is, um, oh wait, I'm sorry, that's 0.3. 0.3. If Q is 0.3 and P plus 0.3 is equals 1, then, you know, basic algebra would tell you P has to be 0.7. Okay? So that would tell us our allele frequencies. Now we got to find um, the, the frequency of dominant heterozygous and recessive. So to find the frequency of, um, let's do uh, stone order, to do the homozygous dominant, big D, big D, that's going to be your P squared. And P squared would be 0.7 squared, which is 0.49. Then we got to find the heterozygous. So that's 2PQ. So 2 
times P, which is 0.7, times Q, which is 0.3, and that's going to give you um, 0.42. And then you got to do little d, little d, which is Q squared. Q is 0 0.3. 0 0.3 squared is 0 0.09. And then check your work. I know you're going to be on the exam and you're going fast. It's worth it to just real quick be like, does that add up to 1? And it does, I think. Yeah. There you go. Um, and that's all they ask for. They, they could then ask for the number of individuals. So let's say they ask that the number of individuals that are big D, big D, that's then where you're going to multiply the frequency of big D, big D by the population total. So multiply it by 500 and do the same thing for um, the heterozygous and the homozygous recessive. Okay? So I, again, I go back to like, at least for me, the hinge point is remembering that start with the, 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 the homozygous recessive. That is your, that's your entry point to solving these problems. Once you get that, that's going to help you figure out Q. And then once you got Q, you got P, and then you can use the, uh, the second equation to find everything else. Okay. Any questions? Uh, I'll give you, that's about like 105, so like 25 minutes, we'll, we'll start doing uh, phylogeny. It'll be pretty quick.